Okay, I think we'll go ahead and begin. I know some people will be coming in, uh, but we, we do need to get started. This is the uh, sixth plenary session, and it's the Raymond Schwager Memorial Prize prize that was uh, established by cover after the death in 2004 of uh, Father Raymond Schwager, the uh, Jesuit who worked uh, in Innsbruck, worked with uh, René Girard uh, throughout the early days of cover. Uh, and just to honor his memory and to encourage uh, younger scholars in their endeavors in writing a paper. This year's winner is Lyle Enright. He is doing his doctorate at the uh, Loyola University in Chicago, uh, working with uh, such people as Mark Bosco and Colby Dickinson, as well as uh, the man who needs no introduction, uh, Andrew McKenna. Uh, and his dissertation topic is Representations of Divine Power in the 21st Century Novel. Uh, he also uh, just recently had an article published in uh, Renaissance on uh, Shusako Endo. And today he will be speaking to us on uh, Girard, Agamben, and the Glory of the Lord. And so before he begins, I would like to uh, make this presentation to him. This is uh, just a certificate saying that the 2017 Raymond Schwager Memorial Prize is awarded to Mr. Lyle J. Enright for his work, Gerard Agamben and the Glory of the Lord, in Madrid, the 14th of July, 2017, signed by Angel Barajona and Jeremiah Albrecht. So. Congratulations. So, please. This is the part my wife's most excited about. Um, first, a thank you to, to all of you. Thank you to, to Jeremiah, and thank you to the committee, and a big thank you especially to Dr. McKenna, who came out of retirement a little over a year ago to school a few of us in the doctoral program in, in Girard, and really set a course for me. He always refers to himself as our promoter. <laughs> and that's been absolutely true as he's gone over my work and and helped me clarify some of my ideas, which I will be. Uh, he, he said after, after reading through some of this material that it sounded like a, a dissertation proposal, which is great because this is like half of my dissertation <laughs> proposal that, I'm, that I'll be presenting here um, in a slightly kind of compacted format. So though the literature on the topic has been slim, several recent commentators have identified a close affinity between the project of political philosopher Giorgio Agamben and René Girard's theory of mimetic rivalry with its resolution through sacrificial scapegoating. Both are theories of social unity made possible through highly ritualized forms of exclusion. Girard's work posits desire and its conflictual consequences as the ultimate ground for all social systems, while Agamben views the same systems with an eye towards the maintenance of sovereign power. Agamben roots his study in the obscure figure of the Roman homo sacer, the sacred man, who is excluded from the laws of both man and the gods such that the subject is not fit to be sacrificed to the gods, but may yet be killed with impunity. This paradigm demonstrates the way in which power claims for itself the right to declare subjects as bios, politically recognized life, or zoe, naked life, stripped of its political rights or recognitions. Thus, sovereign power exists in a sacred state of exception insofar as it bears the right to impose a state of exception upon others, placing them under the indictment of the law while removing the law's protection. I won't further rehearse Girard's own theory of mimetic violence here, as we've done this for three days. Um, but one can certainly see where scholars have been tempted to make connections. Agamben's homo sacer bears many similarities to the sacrificial victim, who just as in Girard's theory is placed in a state of exception due to perceived guilt. Meanwhile, the sovereign state of exception described by Agamben is very like the one described by Girard by which the king maneuvers his victimary place as exceptional within the sacrificial system in order to maintain his power. These affinities demonstrate that these two otherwise disparate thinkers have crucially identified a common mechanism at the heart of human relationships. 
However, while Girard's theory begins in human interpersonal relationships before extrapolating into theories of religion and politics, Agamben begins from the other end. Theorizing the development of Western government, Agamben remains committed to maintaining a separate space for the political and the religious. Consequently, the sacred plays two different and competing roles in the projects of these two thinkers. For Girard, the sacred is the violent heart at the core of human interaction, which is perpetu perpetuated within all of our institutions. While religion is in this way the source of our problems, it is also for Girard the thing which will provide a way out. Meanwhile, Agamben is keen to keep the sacred at a distance, loath to dignify the violence of government with such a term as sacrifice, and insistent that while religion may have a role to play in what he terms the coming community, that role is as handmaid to philosophy and politics. Here I see a crucial split, which has largely gone unaddressed in juxtapositions of these thinkers' work. Most investigations into the relationship between Girard and Agamben have been conducted on Agamben's terms, largely concluding upon a rejection of Girard's too naive faith in Christian revelation. There appears to be a preference for Agamben's narrative in which the crisis of contemporary politics is a direct and inevitable result of latent aporias within Christian theology. So my purpose here is to approach the issue from the other end, namely as a Girardian and as a theologian, to critically examine Agamben's conclusions and suggest that the revisionary image of Christian deity in Girard's work offers the contemporary theopolitical imagination a viable alternative to the profanation of divine glory which Agamben's thought appears to require. In El Reino y la Gloria, or the Kingdom and the Glory, Agamben gives a compelling historical account of the relationship between Trinitarian theology and contemporary politics. His study opens with Eric Peterson's critique of Carl Schmitt. Schmitt had suggested that all political categories are secularized religious ones, with the monarchic sovereign god residing at the core. Peterson, meanwhile, argued that the Trinitarian conception of God, by imagining God as a reciprocal interaction between three persons, could have no possible earthly analog. Therefore, according to Peterson, a properly political theology was po theologically impossible. Agamben, however, uses Peterson's corrective to demonstrate that the opposite is true. The ancient formulations of the Trinity in Christian theology conceived of God in the terms of oikonomia, not as a monarchic sovereign, but as a government of bodies and things, or as a form of administration. Oikonomia thus described not only the relationship within God's self as Trinity, but also the means by which God acted in the world through providence, employing both the church and a bureaucracy of angels to effect the divine will in the world. So contra Peterson, Agamben argues that the Trinitarian oikonomia is inherently a political paradigm, and that this paradigm of divine government which such theology made possible, has been the principal mode of sovereign power in the West, as opposed to the paradigm of the monarch. Thus, Agamben glosses Foucault, the king reigns, but he does not govern. Agamben's historical theological justification for this position lies in what he calls the anarchy of the sun and the economy of glory. According to Agamben, in order for Trinitarian theology to place Christ the Son as equal to God the Father, the Son and Father alike need exist anarche, without either beginning or ground. Thus a gap is created within the Godhead such that no ground to their power can be found. The persons of the Trinity become caught up in an endless circuit of glorification, affirming one another's power, though that power has no foundation. And the performance of that worship is intensified by the angels and repeated in the liturgies of the church. As Mitchell Dean puts it, quote, for a Gombin, Christianity is less a political theology with its foundation in a divine monarch than an economic theology of potentiality and action without foundation. So it is that a Gombin provides the answer to his own leading question, quote, why does power need glory? If it is essentially force and capacity for action and government, why does it assume the rigid, cumbersome, and glorious form of ceremonies, acclamations, and protocols? Governmental power needs glory because just as in the case for the Trinitarian theology upon which it is modeled, that power has no ground. It is functionally inoperative and impotent. 
Under Agamben's reading, glorification, which once took the form of liturgy and now takes the form of media and public opinion, plays a constitutive role in empowering systems which otherwise possess no legitimacy. Thus, Agamben can say with Emil Durkheim that it is true the gods would die if they were not worshipped. If correct, Agamben's thesis has profound implications for understanding the relationships between religion, violence, and politics. For Agamben, glory is the means by which sovereign power disguises its essential illegitimacy and inoperability. And the legacy of Christian thought is that it has bequeathed such strategies to modern governments so that they might misrepresent their own monopoly on violence. By this and similar logic, several strains of self-described radical theology have declared dead the traditional conception of a powerful God in whom sovereignty and glory can be displayed as goods. Perhaps most astonishingly, this isn't only Christian theology which falls under this indictment, but practices of worship as well, prompting one reader of Agamben to argue, quote, if we are to appropriate Agamben's work for theology, then such a theology certainly cannot take the form of glory, either theoretically or doxologically in thanks, praise, and adoration. If theology has traditionally constituted itself through glory in the attention it gives to divine being and economy, perhaps a profane theology would constitute itself through ignorance and neglect. Such a theology would no longer revel in thanks, praise, and adoration, but treat God and God's economy as a disused object, as essentially inoperative. Agamben's theological exegesis has not escaped unscathed, of course, and there are many reasons to bring his readings to task, but rather than reiterate those important, but I think myopically metaphysical issues, I would like to finally turn the conversation towards Gerard, where I see potential in his work for talking back to Agamben on these crucial issues, namely the maintenance of the sacred and the question of worship. In his essay, Sacrificial Pasts and Messianic Futures, Christopher A. Fox demonstrates that the difference between Girard's and Agamben's approaches to the sacred is crucial, for it also contributes to each thinker's assessment of Christianity's political viability. In Homo Sacer, Agamben roundly rejects the thesis of the ambivalence of the sacred, which would tightly knit politics, violence, and religion together, as occurs in Girard's theory. Agamben is deeply invested in locating a moment at which politics becomes its own path, capable of solving its own problems. By attempting to separate out the political and religious, Agamben elects to pursue politics beyond the sacred and the profane, while equivocating between the religious and the sacred in the kingdom and the glory, declaring both to be vacuous. But Fox notes that Agamben's turn towards theological paradigms as sources of government deeply complicates this commitment, if not contradicting it outright. In fact, Agamben's thesis in The Kingdom and the Glory perhaps brings him closer to Girard than he appears in Homo Sacer. Given Girard's argument that no political system can transparently employ the scapegoat mechanism following the Christ event, Agamben's entire approach might make sense just as just one such post-sacrificial paradigm. However, in Brian Sudlow's article, Agamben, Girard, and the Life that Does Not Live, Sudlow demonstrates that Agamben's work still ultimately leads him into the limits of a politics which is intra-anthropic and therefore fruitless as Sudlow says. Despite attempts to transcend mimesis by recourse to the pre-linguistic, Agamben's failure to grasp mimesis as imitation rather than mere repetition brings his politics of bare life dangerously close to a scenario in which mimesis, in Girard's terms, is permitted to proliferate unchecked without the, quote, sacred frameworks of bios. In this sense, a Girardian reading affirms biopolitics to be a necessary, though ultimately pernicious, check on the violence which bare life would produce on its own. The fact that Agamben rejects Christianity as one more form of biopolitics opens the key fissure which I wish to explore from here, namely the difference it makes that Agamben equivocates between the sacred and the religious and places them both within the melody of glory, while Girard traces out an option which, in Sudlow's words, is divine but not sacred. The divine option opened up by Girard is one which sees Jesus Christ as not only the revealer of the scapegoat mechanism, but also the God who reveals Godhead as on the side of victims. The self-oblation of Christ becomes the form which all participants in the kingdom of love are to imitate. 
As such, there is indeed an oikonomia at work here, but is that oikonomia political in the sense that Agamben uses throughout the kingdom and the glory? As Agamben traces the debates between Schmidt and Peterson, he notes Peterson's attempt to deactivate the problem of political theology by positing the Trinity as a concept of unity which cannot be found in human nature. Schmidt would ultimately respond by saying that such a view merely, quote, introduced a sort of theory of civil war into the core of the Trinitarian doctrine, and in this way could be said to be still using a theological political paradigm. This is an argument which Agamben largely follows throughout his study. But such a civil war is hardly conceivable within classical Trinitarian theology, making Agamben's casting of the Trinitarian oikonomia as a political paradigm highly suspect. Far from competing with one another, the persons of the Trinity imitate one another in the holiness of perfect peace and love, an imitation which is also invitation, and which, Gerard says, reactivates the possibility of a positive mimesis which opens the way to the kingdom of God. While tracing Peterson's argument that the monarchy of the triune God is altogether different from the monarchy of a single person, Agamben glosses a paradigm offered in Aristotle, which he says fell into disuse among Judeo-Christian theologians, in which God leads the world as a strategist leads an army, as opposed to acting as some sort of puppet master. If we take Gerard's reading of the gospel seriously, this is precisely the sort of paradigm which is resuscitated, wherein God leads by example through Christ. The difference between such an interpretation and Agamben's is again rooted in what I believe to be Agamben's failure to treat mimesis as imitation rather than as repetition. For it is repetition which Agamben is concerned with in his argument, namely the repetition of the Trinitarian paradigm in the oikonomia of Western government. Agamben's ultimately concerned with the problem of representation and with the fact that the Trinitarian oikonomia made it possible for governments to represent God on earth just as the Son represented the Father. However, earthly governments have also inherited the anarchy of the Son, the groundlessness of his power, and so require glory in order to disguise their illegitimacy. But for Girard, the anarchic power of, of Christ, the anarchic nature of Christ, is hardly problematic because there was never any question of representing Christ on earth. Girard makes it clear in battling to the end that the mimesis between God and the church is not one of representative power, but contextual and progressive imitation, an imitation which has historically met with varying degrees of success. Again, a Girardian reading mightily affirms Agamben's diagnoses, but sees the problem differently, namely that Agamben has rightly diagnosed in Western biopolitics the attempt to imitate and represent divine power as management, when in fact divine power manifests itself by enabling the imitation of divine character as a love which transcends competition or resentment. Fox, for his part, recognizes this to a certain extent, but remains skeptical as to whether or not such imitation can really escape the friend-enemy binary inscribed by Schmidt, and which ultimately both Agamben and Girard are attempting to escape. According to Fox, Girard, quote, interprets the joint decision of all humanity to accept the kingdom of God as intended to end all choosing up sides between friends and enemies. Through submission, all humanity becomes friends, unquote. But for Fox, this really ends up reinscribing the friend-enemy binary at a lot higher level, in which we all submit to God and become friends without enemies. Again, such an interpretation entirely forgets the imitative relational element, which is crucial to Girard's Christianity, in which the imitation of Christ beyond resentment calls us to transcend the friend-enemy distinction, a logic which Girard consistently reminds us passes human understanding. Neither is this an instantaneous universal transformation brought about by submission, as Fox seems to suggest. Rather, the truly radical political character of such an option is evidence through the very form of life opened by the transformative process which Girard imagines, and which must learn to live in tension with those it scandalizes. By way of a conclusion, it's worth returning to the question of glory and whether or not it does indeed disguise an essential inoperativity at the heart of divine and or political power. 
As Agamemnon says in his short essay, The Church and the Kingdom, all powers today are currently facing the crises of their own legitimacy, and no amount of glory can cover this reality any longer. I believe that Gerard would hardly agree with Agamemnon on this point, but in a way which again highlights Agamemnon's refusal to distinguish the sacred from the divine. Agamemnon, I believe, is right to question the need to further laud a god who is already infinitely glorious, and his account of glory as a strategic legitimation of unfounded power remains convincing. Even from a Girardian perspective, the glorification of what is already glorious can hardly constitute an effective Christian apologetic, and such glorification may be and has been used to justify the earthly representations and groundless exercise of divine power. But the earthly imitation of divine love is another thing entirely. And from a Girardian perspective, it must be stressed that worship of the divine is proper insofar as, as it is imitative, being, as Joel Hodge has said, about our reconciliation with God, not the appeasement of God. The Bible not only presents Christ as evidence for a God whose glory takes the side of victims, but also argues that individual transformation is the ultimate apologetic for that glory. The decision to cross the abyss must come from each individual separately, Girard says, for once others are not involved. Christian tradition has variously called this process sanctification or theosis. The latter, used in the Eastern Orthodox Church, emphasizes the human participation in the divine oikonomia with such increasing intimacy that the very ontological difference between God and humanity is radically reformulated. To quote St. Athanasius, the Son of God became man so that men might become God. It is this emphasis on worship as radical openness to transformation which Agamben misses, which Gerard sees as crucial, and which I believe may yet show us a way forward, beyond friends and enemies, to a form of life which passes all human understanding. Thank you. Unfortunately, to keep to our schedule, I'm only going to be able to allow one question, uh, but I would encourage you to uh, speak uh, tonight during the banquet and things like that. But uh, could we have a question, please? <laughs> there we go. Uh, yeah. uh, Andrew, just a moment. Thank you. Uh, this is a question really um, to Lyle, but really to everybody here. Uh, if you, so where does Agamemnon Ag start uh, in order to separate the political from the religious? Because if you start from there, you've given up the game. You've given up history, you've given up eschatology, uh, you've already written religion off. For Girard, you, there is no, there's no such thing as a political science, which is not a biblical anthropology. So my question to you, I suppose, and because frankly, I reject myself, I go by on those terms. But where does the separation from pol of, uh, of politics and religion with uh, Agamemnon, does it begin at the beginning, or does it something he arrives at through other, let's say, questions and answers? Agamben is going to make that distinction with the Homo Sacker. The figure of the Homo Sacker being excluded from both human and divine law, um, Agamben is going to read that as a moment in which sovereign power, earthly sovereign power, claims some kind of authority over divine law or divine power. So that's really the inauguration of the political, is, is sovereign power sets the terms by which human beings exist as subjects of either human law or divine law. So that's where politics goes off on its own direction. But I, I agree with you that, that in making that claim first, I, I've, I've really looked to see uh, where exactly he, he roots his rejection of the ambivalence of the sacred or, or how he, he views it as being a uh, uh, problematic point, and I really, I, I can't find anything beyond a fairly transparent ideological commitment. So I, I think you're right. It, it really depends on where you're going to decide to start. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.
you very much. I'm sorry uh, that we can't continue this discussion. I, I know there are a number of people who would like to talk, but it's, uh, it is 4 o'clock and the next sessions are to begin. So thank you. <laughs>